In terms of setting up these different woofies, because there are different requirements, whether it's trading, manufacturing, uh, service, consulting, or other, there are other special purpose uh, uh, woofies. So for instance, if you're selling agricultural natural products, you would have to set up not a manufacturing woofy or consulting or a, even a trading. There are different brackets for this. And how do you find this out? Well, the Canadian Embassy helps or investment promotion, Chinese investment promotion or consultants such as ourselves. You can find those answers before you actually go into the process of setting up. And again, that's important because the process of setting up is very sequential and very multi-stage. So the trading woofie is something that you could set up in a time span of three months, whereas a manufacturing woofie will definitely take six to 12 months. Um, and again, that has to do with all the regulations and different uh, licenses you have to get. Um, and when I speak about the sequential approach, what do I mean? Well, first, you would have to find the proper location where you want to set up your company, sign a lease agreement. Then you move on to getting tax license, as well as what I mentioned before, being able to issue uh, invoices to your customers. This all goes throughout the sequential approach until you can actually either start to sell to customers, before that even import your goods, you need an import license. And if you're doing a manufacturing woofie setup, there are many licenses you have to get an environmental protection today uh, in order to make sure and safeguard that what you are producing can be sold in China. SME, you will ask yourself, where am I going to set up? Which type of company am I going to set up, a woofy or not? And which type of woofy? What are the legal requirements that flow into it? As I mentioned earlier, sequential, highly administrative but transparent approach. Now comes what about money? Because in the end, every entrepreneur manages for cash, and no Canadian or any international entrepreneur will want to put too much money into China uh, without knowing what the benefit is going to be. So. Part of that question, of course, goes back to your business plan. And in China, you need to deliver a business plan. And according to that business plan, there's a certain capital requirement that runs with it. For example, what's the cost of an office, cost of your staff in the first year, second year, third year, uh, machinery that you'll buy or import. All of this together means the government wants to make sure you can cover that cost through the capital that you pay in at the beginning, right? Now, depending on your industry, depending on the type of company you choose and depending on where you are located. Capital requirements vary. So in Western countries, there's a minimum capital requirement for a type of legal entity. A limited company will be whatever amount fixed and everybody, whether you're producing shoes or selling uh, pharmaceuticals, you have that same minimum requirement. It's only as you grow that you need to stock up your capital. In China, that's different. It, as I said, depends on industry or location type of company. And so you might have a situation where um, typically in China you have clusters. So you have cities that are specialized in one type of product. You need to choose your location carefully, not just from the perspective of your customers, where you want to be set up, but also from where there's a cluster of an infrastructure, so to speak, an environment that is used to your type of industry. Um, so that really drives the capital requirement predominantly. If you ask me for a ballpark figure, it's about 150,000 Canadian dollars to set up a woofy, a wholly owned foreign enterprise, a 100% daughter company. Um, but again, that can vary uh, up and down to the, uh, the type of business you're in and where you're located. The question I then get on as a follow-on question most frequently is, do I need to pay that straight off? And how does that structure itself over time? Can I change? In fact, generally, that's a question that I get, what can I change in the future? So talking about capital, you have a certain requirement to pay up a third or such like at the beginning when you go through that administrative process and then pay up the balance of the capital. Now, the challenge here is you have a business plan and you need to pay up according to that business plan but you don't want to be on the one hand too bullish and pay in millions of Canadian dollars that might lie in China unused or underutilized. And you don't want to have too little capital either. Because if you have too little capital, that means you're going to have to send more money over from Canada. And then you'll have to go through a very administrative process again of stocking up your capital, which means you need to get a capital verification report, a pay-in report, because people want, will want to know, government will want to know why are you, you know, sending more money over? Of course, foreign direct investment is welcome, but 
you know you made a business plan and now you're saying you have to send more capital over so this balance is something to get right in the business planning The other most frequent change is business scope. Um, so I set up my company and I say I want to do sales of a specific type of product. Um, but in the end, it turns out I want to actually provide more service on top of that sales. So there are business scope changes that are very easy to facilitate. But again, you need to do that with your local government, the so-called SAIC, State Administration. You need to register that change. Um, and unless it's something that's very far from what you were originally doing, you will tend to get approval for it, but it will just take time. I think one of our clients' key or core uh, ideas for a Hong Kong company is it's part of China, but it isn't in the end. If you understand what I mean, which is it's a separate jurisdiction, it has a separate legal and tax system, and it's fairly independent from the central government in China on a uh, daily business and operational setup. Most of my clients will ask me whether Hong Kong makes sense for an Asian business. Because Canadians coming out, I'm not necessarily just focusing on China. If I'm selling goods that I produce in Canada, for example, I will want to sell them throughout Asia, depending on what type of products you're selling. And then you have to ask yourself the question, can I manage this all from Canada so far away, or do I need to have something within Asia that functions as either my holding office from a legal perspective or my holding office from an operational perspective? Let me explain how to perhaps make that decision because you have different options. If I take the scenario of a Canadian producer or seller of goods or services selling to China. You could do that point to point. You have a customer in China and you're just selling to them directly. That for sure in a certain style of business is very simple and depending on your industry is the easiest way to go. But now imagine you have multiple customers in China. Are you going to send the goods every time individually? That's probably not the most efficient thing. So you'll think about consolidating it in terms of a distribution or warehousing in China. The advantage of Hong Kong in this case being that you can do that offshore and you're not paying any tax. There's no VAT system in Hong Kong, no customs. You can keep the goods in Hong Kong until they're actually sold. And the transportation between Hong Kong and China, anywhere in China, basically by land, sea or air, is highly developed and highly sophisticated. So again, option one, selling direct to your customer in China. Option two, using uh, Hong Kong as a gateway. China also has a system like this, so-called bonded trade zones or bonded warehouses, where you can also import your goods, the biggest one being in the Shanghai Free Trade Zone by Gaochao. Uh, you can import your goods and leave them uh, in the free trade zone until you've actually sold to the Chinese customer and it crosses the, the line, the demarcation into the country, and only then again you're paying customs and tax. So Hong Kong makes sense, I think, predominantly for the, for the Asian setup, um, but also for the Chinese setup from this perspective of selling, but also from a legal perspective, as I mentioned before, if you have multiple entities into China or if you have joint ventures, it might be easier with your partners to set up a joint venture in Hong Kong and have the, the, the split of equity in Hong Kong and be one investor into China, setting up a single company, as opposed to setting up a joint venture here, which is much more administrative, much more difficult to manage. So it's, you know, again, I mentioned before, the, the level of risk and the level of complexity you want to reduce. This can be done through a, a Hong Kong holding structure.